So we are now live and welcome everyone to another Blue Light webinar. This time, uh, for the first time on one of these webinars, we have a panel and what a panel we have for you. So my name is Brendan from Blue Light and uh, many of you will know me already. If you don't, uh, over the past several years, I've been coaching and supporting people for the police recruitment process, done some stuff for the European Union, uh, work with police forces, all sorts of stuff. But today is all about a sub subject which tends to confound and confuse people who want to join the police and that's the police education qualifications framework the peqf so we're going to talk about all sorts of stuff um, around degrees and the necessity for degrees and why we're going down that route and uh, what you can do to prepare all of that kind of cool stuff uh, so um i hope you'll join us for this next hour or so and if you're watching this on the replay uh, thank you for joining us, uh, but don't feel as though you can ask any questions in the chat function because I have had, honestly, I have had someone get in touch and say, the chat function is not working. I'm watching this on YouTube and the chat function is not working. Uh, um, so, you know, it's not going to work if you are watching this on the replay. So before we start uh, looking at any questions, I've got some uh, big list of questions here. And one of our um, panel members did say, goodness, it's going to feel like a job interview. No, it won't, because I know this lot are a feisty bunch. Um, getting them to stop pulling each other's leg might be a bit of a challenge. But before we do that, uh, let's do some introductions so you know who is on the panel, our panel of experts. So first of all, up there in the top <laughs> left-hand corner, we have our... Uh, Red Five, come in Red Five. <laughs> Hi, um, yeah, I'm Rich Honus, uh, Senior Lecturer in Policing at Canterbury Christchurch University. Um, I am the Programme Leader for the Degree Holder Entry Programme at CCCU, um, working with Surrey, Sussex and Hampshire Police through the Police Education um, Consortium, um, which you'll probably get to hear about uh, as we progress because um, one of the other panel members is also working on that from her own institution uh, and I'm an ex-police officer. Uh, I was 14 years uh, all of it frontline uh, with the Metropolitan Police uh, before I met up with another one of our panel members, uh, Emma, who um, got me uh, involved with, in study and has effectively led me to where I am today. <laughs> so, um, on the Millennium awful. Falcon. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's Emma's fault. Um, but yeah, that's me. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you, Rich. You're very welcome. Often uh, also known uh, affectionately on Twitter as the Big On. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. And over in the top right hand corner, we have Lauren. Lauren, uh, where are you from? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so my name is Lauren Metcalf and I'm a lecturer in policing at Stafford University and I'm also a course leader for the professional policing pre-join degree. Um, my background is not uh, operational police but more academic so I've come through the academic route um, and now lecture at Stafford Uni. Lovely, thank you Lauren. And moving over down towards my bottom left hand corner we have, we have because you don't know, we're all at we the top. We don't know, we're in different orders. <laughs> oh, you're in different, oh, Steve, <laughs> the, delights of, the delights of um, modern technology. So, um, okay, Claudia, please uh, introduce yourself. Oh, so, sorry, I didn't work that one out. Um, yeah, my name's Claudia Cox. I'm a senior lecturer in policing at the University of Portsmouth. Um, so we are also part of the same consortium um, that Rich already mentioned. So we're um, one of the other four, one of the four universities. So uh, also working with Hampshire, Surrey, Sussex. Um, but particularly, I'm the programme lead for the Police Constable Degree Apprenticeship. So um, I have a cohort of degree apprenticeship students in Sussex at the moment and getting ready for the next one with Hampshire um, in a couple of months time. Um, I'm the same as Lauren, um, not a background in operational policing, but more the academic route. Um, have worked with a number of different forces, particularly around um, recruiting police officers conveniently, um, diversity and recruitment um, and recruitment into specialist posts um, as well. So firearms, recruitment to firearms, things like that. Fantastic. And I believe we may have a guest appearance um, in your room at some point during the webinar. Yeah, absolutely. The chances of my dog appearing, she already did about 10 minutes ago before we went live. So she will probably make an appearance as well. But if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen plenty of her anyway. So. Fantastic. Lovely. Lovely. So uh, 
Um, and then in my middle, just underneath me, it's like university challenge, this, isn't it? Uh, we have uh, an old colleague of mine. I'm not going to, no, that's not right, is it? A colleague of mine. No, an old colleague. <laughs> you know. <what> I, mean? <laughs> I, I, suppose, I suppose I am getting a bit older, yes. <laughs> so, Martin, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, yes. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Martin Holleran. I work at uh, York St John University um, as a senior lecturer in policing where we do the degree in professional policing and the licensed product from the College of Policing also run police studies courses and are currently working with Humberside Police developing the uh, degree apprenticeship and the degree holder entry program uh, and Yes, and with apologies to some of the others, yeah, I do have an operational policing background. Um, but some of my main, yeah, <laughs> uh, some of my main interests really are about uh, one that's really interested me recently is the transition from further education into higher education, particularly into the sort of policing programmes. So that's something I'm currently looking at at the moment. All right, great stuff. Thank you, Martin. And we also have uh, Bethany. So Bethany, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Bethany and I work at Staffordshire University. I'm a recruitment development officer and I work in partnership with uh, four regional police forces. That's West Midlands Police, Staffordshire Police, Warwickshire and West Mercia. So we work in partnership on all things related to recruitment. So that kind of goes all the way from widening participation, equality and diversity, positive action all the way through to the actual recruitment process. So what students, so we're supporting students um, throughout the process um, through their search assessment and um, what help they can get from us um, the actual recruitment process itself. So the eligibility checks when it comes to the apprenticeship um, and all things recruitment related. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I'm, I'm surprised we've not met before. It's, you mentioned the word recruitment and police a lot there. So yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly the thing yeah. that I'm interested in as well. Um, and lastly, uh, we have uh, the, the star of stage, screen and Twitter. We have Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, that was quite an intro. Thanks for that, Brendan. Um, my name is Emma Williams. I'm the director of the Canterbury Centre for Policing Research and the programme director for the two level seven programmes we have at Canterbury for serving police officers, um, applied police practice and a by research programme. Um, and prior to that, I was the programme director for the BSC in service policing. So I don't actually teach on the PCDA or the professional programme at the moment, um, but I did work with the College of Policing on a secondment um, prior to um, the proper launch, if you like, of the PQF. Um, and prior to my role in academia, I was a principal researcher at the Metropolitan Police Service for nine years um, and the Ministry of Justice for two years also. Um, so whilst I'm not actually involved practically working on the PCDA, um, I have got quite a few views on it, I guess. <laughs> Ooh, that's what we want. We want some views. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, and I knew, I knew you'd have some views, Emma. Uh, and actually, you know, your, your background in terms of what you're currently doing with the Level 7 stuff, uh, just, just to make sure that people understand that Level 7 equals Masters. Am I right there? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, yeah. Level 7 yeah, Masters degrees. They don't say they don't use phrases like level seven stuff, do they, in uh, universities? But uh, you, you know what I mean. So um, that might be useful actually, because uh, in conversations around, so now what? I've got my bachelor's in policing. Now what? I'm an operational police officer. Where do I take it? So it might be interesting there to hear about some of the things that some of your um, students are currently doing who are operational. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're all very, very welcome. And welcome also to all of you who are attending this. I can see here we've got. 31 participants, and that's just the people who are actually ready to participate. I know there might be some of you in the background who are lurking, and that's perfectly fine. If you just want to watch this and not take part, that's fine. But uh, what I intend to do is ask um, some of the questions that I posed earlier, just to give them a bowl, a bit of an idea about where the conversation is going to go. And that's how this should be. It should be just like a conversation. Like we're all on this big sofa um, in this world, 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 weird, weird coronavirus world that we're in at this moment in time. Um, we're all staying at home, saving lives. Uh, and for those of you who are at home saving lives and staying at home, you can partake in asking questions as well. So what I'll probably do is run off one or two questions that we've sort of uh, prepared this morning. And then as questions roll in on the chat function, 
I'll try and bring those in as well. So please do ask questions using the chat function and we will do our very, very best to get around to them. Like I said, about an hour, but it may go over an hour. Um, it, it depends on uh, how much interest you show as uh, people who are attending. Uh, so like I said, please do ask questions. So the first question I've got then for the panel is, um, why a degree? Why does the police service actually need to have a degree requirement? What was so wrong with the Ipple Dipple, the initial police learning and development program? So I don't know who wants to uh, start that one off. Go on, I, I'll, I'll start with a slightly different angle because I'll say, um, you, you started by saying, oh, why do, why do the police now need a degree or something like that? And I'll, I'll quote someone else, which is, it might be obvious who, but uh, a chief constable who I heard addressing students on, on day one, mm -hmm. he said, actually, this isn't about saying from this point forwards, police officers need a degree. It's about saying up until this point, police officers have been working at degree level. They have been you know, developing exceptional skills, taking on immense amounts of really complex knowledge and having to process information quickly and, you know, gaining all of these skills, these knowledge, demonstrating all these behaviours and not really being recognised for it. Mm -hmm. And this is about now recognising that. And there are some formalities to that, you know, yes, you, you maybe need to submit things to demonstrate it. Um, you know, we, we can't just hand out a degree um, for so many different reasons. Um, but actually, this is about finally recognising the level police officers have been working at, rather than saying, from this point forwards, we think policing needs to be degree level. All right, thanks, Claudia. So, and, and, Rich, and sort of, yeah, yeah and sort of, sort of to go on to that, because as I say, it was two, two parts to that question. And one of the one of those was well, what was wrong with with the Ipple Dip, and um, there'd been a lot of criticisms of the Ipple Dip from uh, a number of pla places, including um, HMIC, uh, including um, the police chiefs, who basically said that the Ipple Dip curriculum was too narrow. Um, it didn't contain anything, for example, on vulnerability. Um, it was just expected that that is something that police officers would just muddle through on. Um, it didn't provide enough on things like using information in intelligence, which is something obviously the police officers need um, to be able to do. Uh, when I went through training, I went through even, an even, the even older um, version. I did the 18 week residential training at the Hendon Police Training School. And it certainly, even then, didn't completely prepare me for going out on the street. Um, because, again, the curriculum itself was too narrow. So one of the reasons why um, the curriculum that we have now uh, is the way it is, is because it's been recognised that actually police officers, during their initial, let's call it education, um, haven't been receiving everything that they actually need. Uh, and so the Ipple Dip curriculum is too restrictive. And um, as Claudia sort of alluded to, it didn't also provide certain skills um, that police officers actually need when they get out on the street. Um, a, a degree program um, will teach students knowledge skills and behaviors which up until now haven't actually been done um we sort of expect police officers to go out on the street and be able to perform certainly the skills and behaviors um as you know as they go so i think i think this is much more focused this is much more um I hate using the word holistic but it's a much more holistic program that new officers need to undertake. Okay, thanks, Rich. I'm going to play. Can, I, can I be slightly cynical here oh, as oh, well? Oh, well, I was just yeah, going to play advocate and say I'm going to start know, throwing that. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was 28 years a police officer, 12, 12, 13 years an operational inspector, but no qualifications in policing whatsoever. Um, is this tr is this trying to say that police officers who don't have qualifications aren't professional? Uh, go on, Martin. Yeah, I think um, it, that sort of alludes to the point. There's a, there's a couple of things here. There obviously is the sort of uh, cliche idea that we are working, you know, police officers are working to that level. And I have, I've got to agree with Claudia on that. And Rich, it's absolutely imperative that people are recognised. And I know that, you know, we'll probably come to this bit about why then is it 
is it been sold as a, uh, you know, you've got to have a degree to be a police officer. But I think what we've also got to recognise as well is that there are other professional jobs around, such as nursing and midwifery, teaching, social workers, ambulance service. And I think that the whole idea is that uh, policing is recognised on the same level as, uh, you know, a lot of those public service jobs. But also to be um, a, a little bit um, cynical as well is that there are other underlying reasons. And I think the, the reality is with the changes in pensions and length of service requirements and things like that, we've got to recognise that people probably aren't going to have a 35, 40 year career in policing um, as I had a 30 something year uh, career in policing. You know, people are going to move in and out. And I think it's only right that we reward and recognise people for the work that they do. And then if they choose to leave after five, you know, four, five, six, ten years or whatever, because, you know, it's not the job for them or life circumstances have changed. At least, as you were just saying, Brendan, they can walk away with a recognised qualification. You know, previously, what used to happen, and to many of my colleagues still now, and I talk, you know, I could talk to people who are interested in becoming lecturers, and, you know, a lot of those people have, you know, great backgrounds in policing, but don't even hold, you know, a degree or even A-levels, because they left school at, at 16, because it wasn't compulsory. So I think, you know, we, we have to recognise that it's not going to be a, um, a career for life for a number of people, especially if you're starting in your you know late 30s and 40s um but also as well i think there's the going to be slightly controversial now there's always been this drive as well to recruit more from bme communities and i looked at your uh, webinar with the superintendent from knots whose name escapes me i do apologize uh, to him sukesh, sukesh verma yeah sukesh verma i looked at that as well you know and obviously that's really really important but i think there was a drive to say look Policing is a professional job. Some people from different backgrounds wouldn't come into the police service unless it's a professional occupation. And professional occupation, part of that, it's about having a degree qualification and having a recognised way in which, you know, Emma's doing at CCCU about going through to a master's and a doctorate and things like that. That, that never happened. And I think that's what we're trying to change at the moment. Right, lovely. Thank you, Martin. Um, so, trying to cover all the forces from all, uh, sorry, all the universities from all parts of the country. Uh, so, Staffordshire, uh, Lauren and Bethany, is there anything you can add to that or maybe disagree with or agree with? So, yeah, so I'll go. Um, I think I agree with the points that have been said, and it's not about the necessarily the appeal dip wasn't suitable in some ways, but it's about progressing. Um, and taking account for all the additional roles that policing now do, the, those additional priorities that maybe weren't covered before um, and doing it in more depth. So the, the now the focus on technology, digital technology and policing, the safeguarding aspects, mental health is huge. And you'll see that throughout the College of Policing curriculum, all those things are coming in. Um, and I agree with the point that it's not a case of saying that policing isn't, wasn't professional before. It's about honouring those people um, who do the job and giving them that accreditation to say yeah look you've got you've got something to show for it now rather than just a degree you've also got uh, an educational paper certificate. Okay lovely thanks Lauren and Bethany from a recruiting perspective then um, how do potential recruits find this concept of at some point I'm going to have to get a degree? I think that um, I would like to say that quite a lot of people are quite um, undecided on the reason behind why we've decided to um i think quite a lot of people think that we've just decided to professionalize the police service that's said quite a, a lot and um, hear that one quite often um but it, it's not a case of you know just decided to professionalize it's it's recognizing an extremely professional career that you know comes with a qualification that the the person so rightly deserves um, and that's how we, um, when, we, when we're talking about recruitment and we're talking about um, students that are potentially looking to get degrees and, you know, it's why do I have to have a degree to do this? Uh, well, actually, um, the skills that you acquire throughout the course of the programme give you what you rightfully deserve at the end of it. Um, and I think uh, another selling point, um, which is what Martin alluded to, is that 
um, you are the, the the skills that you're that you're sort of gaining as part of that are totally transferable, um, and they're not just transferable outside the police service; they're transferable inside the police service as well. So if you decide to specialise in a certain area or go into a, a certain department, for, for example, um, those skills that you've um, acquired prove that you are more than competent, both operationally and academically, to 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 take on, on the world in, in a policing um, or uh, in respect of policing or outside of policing, maybe. Lovely, thanks. I like that uh, idea, take on the world. Um, that's how a lot of police officers feel, don't they, when they're doing their initial training? Absolutely, yeah. Take on the world, yeah, the, the spirit that exists within them is incredible. Uh, Emma, I'm not going to forget about you. So, Emma, mm -hmm. you've been, been, been part and parcel of the sort of um, the, the journey here uh, to this point. Um, thoughts from yourself? Um, I think um, probably bringing in a slightly different aspect of it, you mentioned um, earlier about professionalisation agenda, which is obviously a wider agenda than just the PQF. Um, I think what's got lost a little bit and remains lost, even now being two, three years into this whole conversation, maybe even longer, is the um, upskilling and um, you know, qualifications available to serving officers as well. Um, I think when we talk about the PQF, we always focus on the apprenticeship programme and the pre-join programme. But what we forget about is the wealth um, of experience and knowledge that current officers have already. And they are potentially going to leave their job without those qualifications and without those accreditations that they will see their um, officers around them getting. Um, and more importantly, actually, they are expected then to support those officers through their uh, early stages of their career. Um, and sometimes I think that can be quite threatening if they haven't got that academic background themselves. Um, if they're expected to support somebody who's doing a level six degree program and learning about all the contextual side of policing, the you know, relationship police have with society, with politics, with the community, and they haven't got that actual background, I think that can be quite difficult for um, supervisors, for you know, tutor constables, etc. Um, and um, I, I'd like to have seen perhaps a little bit of embedding or prepared, preparedness going on before we went through this process as we are. But that's just my, my view, um, because the professionalisation agenda applies to all police officers, not just new ones. They are very professional already, so let's recognise that. Yeah, I think that's what, one of the things that might have got people's... Um... Uh, attention and people some people get quite angry about it you see on Twitter this sort of a degree gate and Twitter storms of uh, uh, abuse about the, the whole degree thing um, something maybe about the words that are being used so it's not saying that the police aren't professional it's about demonstrating that professionalism and I think a lot of police officers took it as you try to say I'm not professional you know I've been working for 20 years doing an incredibly difficult job very very challenging what the hell do you know um, and I wonder, you know, sort of building on that a little bit, and I do recognise we've got one or two questions from the, the, uh, the chat room, and I'll get around to those in a moment. I'll try and link them into other subjects, but just wonder what everyone's thoughts are on that sort of marketing that it seemed to come across as to join the police, you need to have a degree, which isn't quite right because you can join under the police constable degree apprenticeship and then get a degree. I just wonder what your thoughts are, because I've always thought, I wonder if they've got this wrong. Perhaps they should have just pitched it to say that the Ipple dip is over a decade old. It's not fit for purpose anymore. We want to be ambitious with your training and with your education as a police officer. So we're going to link in with universities. You're going to get the benefit of academics who are experts in their field in terms of research into policing. You're going to get the benefit of operational police officers of some of those academics who are operational police officers and have been operational police officers. And it, we're going to latch another year on it as well because we think this is so important. And do you know what? At the end of it all, at the end of it all, you're going to get a degree as opposed to a piece of paper that's worthless outside the police. You're going to get a degree. We're going to award you a degree and you're going to be so proud because you're going to be able to attend this graduation ceremony. And do you know what? We're going to pay for it as well. I just, I don't know. I just wondered if we'd missed a trick because that to me just sounds so attractive and I don't know what everyone else's thoughts are on that. Go on Martin. Um, yeah I would agree I certainly agree with you to some extent that perhaps the marketing hasn't gone as well as it 
as it could have done. But I think also that, uh, and I'm going to be slightly controversial again, That's I think okay. some of the, yeah, <laughs> very unusual of me, I know. Uh, but, you know, some of the right wing, uh, right leaning media have sort of jumped on this idea that they've uh, not really seen policing as a profession previously. You know, they've, uh, you know, and you can see it often in the media, and I'm not going to talk about certain newspapers, um, but, you know, you do see it in the media that the police have not been hugely supported by some aspects of the media. They don't see those people as uh, professionals. They just see these people as walking up and down the streets, um, you know, and they don't recognise the professionalism that these police officers have and the way that, um, that police officers support victims and suspects, offenders, you know, witnesses and all the complications. So I think that once uh, the College of Policing talked about, or the, you know, the National Police Chiefs Council talked about this idea of uh, rewarding or recognising people uh, for this degree level work, I think the whole idea is you need a degree to be a police officer. We came to you need a degree to become a police officer. Um, and obviously that was thrown out. And then because of this misinformation put out by some media outlets, you know, then you get some rank and file um, officers, you know, and even some senior officers and indeed, um, you know, uh, PCCs uh, looking at it and saying, no, uh, we don't agree with this and we don't think police officers need degrees. So I think that the it has been jumped on by the media a little bit, but I, I do agree when you've got 43 forces plus the non-home office forces, but we'll talk about the 43 home office forces, and they're often doing things in very separate ways, um, it just becomes a bit of a muddle and there isn't a clear message from a police force. There's 43 different messages plus the superintendent, plus the NPCC, plus the College of Policing. My goodness, that could almost be, seem controversial, Martin. You, we tried to get 43 <laughs> different versions of a message coming out from 43 <laughs> different forces. Who would have known? Uh, Claudia. Yeah, just um, I think one of one of my frustrations, I think, um, and I think shared by my students as well, is a bit of a misunderstanding of um, what it means to study for a degree. So I think a lot of people still have quite a traditional view on what degrees are in terms of a degree must entail sitting in a lecture theatre and a degree must entail writing many, many essays and just reading books over and over again um, and sitting massive long exams at the end of the year. Um, and there are some degrees that still look like that. Um, but that isn't the be all and end all of a degree. Um, you know, and I've, I've had officers come to me and say, well, what, what are you going to do? Pull, pull these student officers out for a day a week to sit in a lecture theatre. Um, you know, what good are they going to get from sitting in a lecture theatre? You think there's so much more to studying for a degree than that. Um, so that's been, a, I think, a bit of a source of frustration for me because um, I like to think that degrees and universities have progressed um, on from that. Um, certainly, I hope Portsmouth has. Um, I think we have. Um, so, so that's been quite a, uh, a frustration for me personally. Right. And, <laughs> and, and to take that even further, and this is probably going to be a bit controversial as well, is when those of us <clears throat> that have been involved in um, writing some of these programmes and have actually looked into them and seen the misinformation, the, the most hostility that I've encountered has been when I've tried to correct that misinformation. Um, and I, I mean, I don't understand why uh, people are so hostile to, um, to, to the correct information. Um, I, I'm sure there's some psychologists online that could probably explain that. Um, but that doesn't help. Uh, and so, it, so the, I mean, and the controversy is there's almost been a few people, I think Martin probably mentioned the press, that are deliberately trying to misrepresent what it is we're trying to do. And um, one of the things that I've always said from the very beginning, um, you know, I was a serving officer when the idea was first floated. I want to see the best operational cops out on the street um, that we can get. And, and that's what these programs, certainly the ones that I've been involved in designing, have been written to achieve. Mm. We want the best possible operational police officers that can operate in the current environment as possible. And, you know. 
Well, I'm, going to bring in, I'm going to bring in um, a staff's union if I can here, because we talked a little bit about, you know, it's not stuffy old lecture halls anymore, and there's far more to doing a degree than exams. Um, and, I'm, you know, the, the very concept of having to sit in lecture halls, um, you know, one day a week and do an exam at the end of the year, it sort of reminds me a little bit of the 70s and 80s. So I see a lot that comes from staff's union, actually, on Twitter. Uh, lots of pictures, and pictures tell a wonderful story. Of, uh, something that's very very different to that so Lauren I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit yeah so I think teaching's moved on completely whilst on like the pre-joined degree we do still work in classrooms and lecture theatres quite a lot especially on the apprenticeship and the DHEP there's a lot of online delivery but all our lectures incorporate um, not just talking about or in PowerPoint presentation talking at students, it's all about interaction. So there'll be videos, there'll be ex practical exercises. There are stuff to engage the students, not about them just talking in classes, but stuff that we use with apps and phones to get them engaged in different ways. Um, and I know on the apprenticeship course, um, they've really worked on how to deliver, because if you have a two hour lecture just sat in front of your computer, actually it might be quite boring. Um, whereas they've worked on different packs and they sort of like trimming down a two hour lecture into chunks, uh, incorporating di these different videos, these different interactions, having pre-reading sessions so it can be more interactive within the actual lecture. Uh, one of the things I've seen, seen you from your Twitter feed is the actual application of those, that knowledge and understanding into, into skills. So um, not too different, but I'm sure enhanced by some of the things that we've done for, for years in the police sector you know, putting student officers through a trial um, and, you know, having student officers look at a vehicle and start looking at where the, where the common use uh, is. And, and how do you actually do a search well to ensure that someone's not hiding drugs because they're watching you very carefully and they know exactly where to hide the drugs. So uh, Lauren and then Claudia, if you want yes. to sort of build on that. Yeah, it's, um, go on, Lauren, did you want to carry on first? No, all I was going to say is no, we've got right. facilities which we can use. So we've got crime scene house, we've got the vehicles, we've got the, the facilities to be able to use and apply the, the learning, the classroom learning to the practical situation. And, and, yeah. and this is some of the facilities that forces just don't have anymore. Mm. Why, why should they when universities have got them? Yeah, yeah and I, I think this, this is one of the other things that frustrates me that I forgot about but I've just remembered and ties in really nicely is, is people saying well you know you, you learn policing by doing policing you don't learn policing by sitting in a lecture theatre that is the entire point of the degree apprenticeship um, a degree apprenticeship is about learning in the workplace um, and our degree apprenticeship students and I can only speak for our course here you know I know there are differences I'm sure we'll talk about that but our degree apprenticeship students are out operationally after between nine and ten weeks um, that is significantly quicker than if they were on um, Ipley Dip. So yes. actually, in terms of getting them out there, getting them to learn by doing, that is at the absolute heart of any degree apprenticeship, not just a policing one. And I've seen someone's commented in there that, you know, they've done the apprenticeship in something else in the past and kind of in trades and, and hopefully they can, uh, they can agree with that or recognise that. But that is what the degree apprenticeship is trying to achieve. Police officers getting some input. There's got to be some input before you let someone go outside in a uniform and, you know, and have the, have the powers that, that the police do. But they go out and they learn from experienced officers and then they demonstrate that they're developing those skills, those, that knowledge, those behaviours through their operational competency, through assessments. They get the degree at the end, they're signed off and so forth. But yeah, it's, it's frustrating as well when we hear, you know, well, why are you pulling them off into universities they should learn by doing? And I say, well, that is what my students are on the apprenticeship are doing. So you mean to say that you might have sergeants saying, do you know I'm getting far less constables saying, Sarge, can I use my power of entry? Because I believe there's someone who's wanted in this house and I'm not quite sure about section 17. And, mm. um, you know, this is about putting that knowledge and understanding into practice. We'll come yeah. to a little bit more later because I want to discuss sort of, you yeah. know, what, what worth does a degree have to communities? Because ultimately, you know, all policing, if it's not neighbourhood policing, then what is it? Because, you know, every terrorist exists in a neighbourhood. Every person who abuses child, children lives in a neighbourhood, I'd suggest. But anyway, before we go on to that, let's, uh, let's take a look at a couple of questions from the, um, the chat room. So we've got Dom, who's saying, hope you're all well. I hope you all are, yes, and I hope you are as well, Dom. Um, so in the final stages of recruitment, one force wanted to transfer his assessment centre score to West Mercia, which was fine. And then a few days later, I was told the university wouldn't accept my maths and English GCSE equivalent as it was done with his access to higher education diploma. 
wanted separate maths English certificates. I have a couple of, I have a diploma in higher education operating department practice that I've undertaken. I hope it makes sense. This is an interesting question, this, because I see this, uh, oh, I'll come to Bethany in a moment. Uh, so I see this across the country and it puzzles me because we've got 43 different ways of recruiting people, plus CNC, Ministry of Defence, Police, BTP, who all do their own recruitment thing. The only thing all 43 have in common is a college policing assessment centre. Everything else is made up by forces, either based on good practice and research or just made up, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, and now we've introduced something which should be three distinct routes into policing, we'll come to those in a moment, which will either recognise a degree or will lead to a degree or a diploma in policing. And yet, what I'm seeing across the board is absolute confusion as to entry points. And I'll give you an example. So, Andy Cook, my mate Andy Cook from uh, Merseyside Police. Most people call him Circus, he's the Chief Constable, but I joined with him in 1985, he was in my class at Bruges. Um, he messaged me the other day just to say, do you know in all of this, all we're going to require from our PCDA, the Police Constable Degree Apprenticeship students, is two GCSEs, one in maths and one in English. And then yet you go to Northumbria, um, they're requiring 120 UCAS points, which is equivalent of, correct me if I'm wrong, three Bs at A-level. My goodness, I had an offer years ago to do medicine of two Bs and a C. Um, I know that was a long time ago, but really, three Bs? And I, I asked the College of Policing about this and they said, um, you know, it all depends on the operational requirements of forces. Well, I'm sorry, Northumbria Police and Merseyside Police to me are pretty much the same in terms of the operational challenges. So two GCSEs at one end, three Bs at A level the other end, and we've got everything in between. So what's going on there? What's happening? Bethany? I think um, it's appropriate to start with entry requirements and as you rightfully point out lots of universities and forces have different entry requirements. Um, my, I forgot to say in my opening introduction that my background is in apprenticeships so I'm quite heavily informed when it comes to um, higher degree apprenticeships especially. Um, the standard non-negotiable entry requirements for any higher degree apprenticeship not just the police constable degree apprenticeship is a level two or equivalent in maths and english unfortunately that is something that no university will be able to negotiate or police force um, so this usually is recognized um, more so as gcse um, a star to c or using the new grading system nine to four um, num number the, the new numbered system um, it can also be functional skills, level two, key skills, um, and the ESFA, who are the Education Skills Funding Agency, who are the people who regulate this and um, grant funding um, for the um, apprenticeship to go ahead, have just introduced adult numeracy and adult literacy as now acceptable evidence. Um, so if anyone is watching and wants to know if their level two is acceptable, that is a, um, um, a bit of information there for you. Um, unfortunately, um, it can sometimes create a barrier if students have done a maths and English qualification as part of another qualification and it doesn't quite meet that requirement. So I'm not sure if your circumstances, Dom, but you may have done English and maths as part of your access um, to higher education diploma. Um, if it's not a standalone level two qualification in its own right, then it won't be acceptable. Um, and unfortunately, that is something that is non-negotiable with the um, ES. SFA, who are the people that regulate higher degree apprenticeships. Um, so I do sincerely apologise if that is the case. Um, unfortunately, you're probably not the only one who is in that situation. Um, and we, um, Staffordshire University, um, we provide lots of guidance um, as to our entry requirements. Um, so just uh, for example, our entry requirements are 64 UCAS points. Um, so that's the uh, level that we feel gives everyone a fair opportunity um, to come into policing um, and that basically means that you need two D's and an E at A level um, or merit merit pass in a BTEC. Um, a level three um, you may not be able to find on the UCAS calculator which is an online tool that tells you how many UCAS points that you've got 
not all level threes are available on, on that medium. So what we do here at Staffordshire University is we literally look on a case by case individual basis and give you what you rightfully deserve in terms of entry onto the programme. Um, so it is always worth asking the question, whatever certificates you've got, level two or level three, we ask you to send them to us or the force and we can really get to grips with looking at whether you have or whether you do or you don't meet the requirement. So in terms of the support that we offer, don't automatically assume that because I haven't listed anything that you may potentially have, that does not mean that you're ineligible. You may well be eligible, but you do need to come forward and ask the question. So there might be something here about shopping around for a force and university that's prepared to accept that type of qualification. Uh, is that what you're saying, Bethany? I mean, lots of, unfortunately, lots of universities um, work differently. Um, their entry requirements, like you say, your friend, um, all they ask for is level two. They don't ask for a level three. And then you can literally go to the other end of the spectrum where you're being asked to have three A-levels, grade B. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a severe sort of shift in terms of entry requirements. Um, I think... From from our perspective, um, we're going to say this because we're biased, but we 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 are we feel as if we are fair. The sixty four UCAS points entry requirements that we do attach to um, as part of the, the PCDA um, is generally something that if people have gone into further education in terms of level three, they should qualify. Um, so we feel as if that is a really fair approach. Not saying that obviously all the universities don't provide a fair enough approach. It's all dependent on people's individual perceptions of the intensity of the programme, how students are going to cope while they're on the programme, how they're going to feel throughout, whether they are going to be academically or operationally competent. And um, sometimes, you know, uh, it, it, it just means that you don't quite meet the entry requirements. Um, yeah. Students may decide to go elsewhere if they uh, they meet in one place, but they don't in the other. That is absolutely their decision. Um, but they do have to bear in mind that they will have to go through the recruitment process, um, which is um, obviously, I'm sure we'll get onto that later, um, but is totally separate from the entry requirements and is a, um, a long withdrawn process. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the criticisms sometimes of the police recruitment process. and. You know, I, I, I do this for a living. I sort of support and help people around, uh, help them navigate the system. Uh, and honestly, I'm confused half the time as well, because we've now, you know, you've mentioned this about the apprenticeship process and how you've got to have that minimum. Yeah. I'm quite sure I've seen that the Met will allow you to start their plan PCDA with just a level two in English, as long as at some point in your first two years, you get yeah. a maths level two. So I just wonder, you know, what happens when you've got your feet under the table, you're seen as an outstanding police officer, and then you fail your maths to level two after two years. Are they really going to ask you to leave? I don't know well, how it work. The um, rules of higher degree apprenticeships are that you are able to start on any higher degree apprenticeship without your level two in maths or English, but you do have to gain it as part of the apprenticeship. Um, so as far as my knowledge goes, um, if you are, are not able to secure um, the level two in maths and English before you enter the gateway, which is the period before your endpoint assessment, then at the end of it, you, you, you won't be awarded completion of the apprenticeship until you prove that you have obtained your level two in maths and or English, depending on which which ones you have or you haven't got. Um, so um, that is something that is possible. Um, however, when it comes to this particular programme, the, our, the university, Staffordshire University, have taken the decision um, not to um, allow that, if you will. Um, it definitely puts more pressure on the student. Um, you know, they get 20% off the job as part of the constable apprenticeship anyway. Um, but adding the pressure of um, obtaining a maths and English GCSE level qualification at the same time um, is, is extremely um, difficult. Um, you know, we, do, we absolutely do not want our students to feel in any way, shape or form as if they cannot handle the pressure um, of doing a series of qualifications alongside an already very intense programme. Um, so we ask for those up front before you come onto the programme. Um, the fact and rule still remain that you do need level two of maths and English in order to be awarded a higher degree apprenticeship, whether you have that before or you get that during the process. All right. So that's how they're managing that. And I do... Wonder actually, you know, when I joined the police in 1985, 
might seem a while back, but some of you might remember that sort of era as well. Uh, my old colleagues. Um, I remember the 70s. Um. <laughs> it was challenging then, and it's probably, you know, I'm quite sure it's even more challenging now. Um, I, I just wonder whether, I'll come, come to you in a moment, Claudia, and I think, Richard, you've got something to say as well, but I, I just wonder whether, you know, we might be promising too much of people who've got two GCSEs because it's a complex world policing, you know, just getting your head around the code of ethics and the link between the code of ethics, um, uh, you know, legitimacy, community engagement, problem solving, all the different partner agencies. Um, it's a big, big complex world. And then all your powers as well and being able to remember them and dance around them operationally at three o'clock in the morning. You know, I wonder what will, and we're early days yet, so we don't know, but the, the dropout rate, I believe, in the nearest sector to policing uh, is nursing. And I think the dropout rate in nursing for the, the, their apprenticeship equivalent, challenge me if I'm wrong, is around 25%. So, you know, is, is Northumbria looking to hedge its bets and make sure it doesn't lose so many? Uh, in Merseyside, are they allowing for that? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the background to this is. Um, I'm just throwing that one in as a tuppence eight is worth. Um, I'm going to bring in Claudia first and then um, Rich and then Martin. Claudia. Thanks. Yeah, so just I will answer that question in two seconds, but I just wanted to pull something out that, that Bethany said that I think is so important. And I've, I've seen someone just pop up on the Q&A saying, I, I've done the certificate of knowledge in policing, like, can that count? I think the real key message here has got to be get in contact with the force and speak to them. Please don't just see, oh, you, you must have maths and English and then you must have an A-level. I don't have that, so I'm out. Um, there are so many people have done so many things that count towards uh, whether it's UCAS points or credit or whatever it is and don't even realise it. Um, and certainly one of the forces we've working, we are working with, say, one A-level. Or if you've done certificate of knowledge in policing, that will also be acceptable. So just anyone who's watching this and thinking, I don't know if I'm eligible, don't just sit and Google it and try and work it out for yourself. Please, please get in contact with the force that you are wanting to apply to. Go to recruitment events and, and ask them. And you may find, as I found with lots of people, you do you have met that, that criteria. You just maybe haven't quite realised it or haven't quite put the pieces together. So, yeah, I just wanted to really, really stress that point of... of get in contact if that's all right um, no. and saying that has meant I've totally forgotten your question what was it because no, okay. um, I've sort of I've, I'm going off at a tangent now as well because I'll, I'll bring in Rich and Martin in a moment but I'm also going to bring in Emma here because um, I think that's an important message there for people who want to join the police who've got a, a background that's not quite as traditional as what forces might be looking for in terms of you must have x number of UCAS points because honestly up to a couple of years ago I, hadn't, I thought UCAS might have been some sort of union for some <laughs> I didn't have a clue what the UCAS point was. Um, and I'm, gonna I'm not going to say which force it was, but you know, the individual concerned uh, is probably going to watch this and will know who they are. Uh, an incredible candidate for the police uh, in her 50s. Uh, left school because she um, is in her 50s. She left school at 16 when you could. And she went on to embark on several different careers. She's raised a family. She's owned her own business. She's been a director of a business, she's worked for charities, she's been in some quite senior positions, but she never actually got a level three qualification. And she went all the way through the recruitment process, right to the very end, only for the force to say, oh, we've just spotted, you don't have a level three qualification. And uh, she said, well, what about all my life experience? No, but would you consider PCSO? And she said, okay, so when do I start? Oh no, you've got to start the recruitment process for PCSO all over again. Now I can see oh. Emma smiling here. This is Emma's world, recognition of prior experience and learning. I know it's part of your world, am I right in the same that Emma? So what, what's going on there? I mean, that, that was just, that just seemed unfair, unjust. And I know to be fair to Northumbria, I'm saying uh, 120 UCAS points. They also say, or equivalent professional experience and qualifications, whatever that means. So Emma, your thoughts on this? Because it just seems to me it's just like confusing and muddying the picture even more. I, I think it is. I think you're probably right. Um, I mean, obviously with the programme that I was looking after prior to moving on to the master's stuff, um, is now run by Jennifer Norman, who is my colleague at Canterbury. Um, and the program that she now directs um, takes people on the recognition of prior experience and learning. And to be fair, we look more for their professional experience than we do at their previous academic background. 
Um, and I can't tell you how many people we've taken on the programme who have said to us on the first day, there is absolutely no way I'm going to be able to do this. I left school with X amount of GCSEs, O levels. Um, I, I know I'm not going to be able to do this. I don't know why I even thought about joining. And those people invariably go through the process with incredibly good, good grades. I could name one individual who is in the Met Police now. He's now a superintendent and he swore to me when he started the programme he was going to fail. And he left with the first and best dissertation award. I, to be honest, at the level I have been recruiting into with the level six and the in-service programme, I don't look at their previous academic background. I, I genuinely, I, we, we really don't particularly look at it. Um, we want to see um, experience. We want to see evidence of some kind of reflective practitioner um, style in their application, um, something around their uh, willingness to look at problem solving, reflect on their mistakes and failures. Um, and it, I, I can I'll honestly say that the majority of people who start the programme and see it through, and of course we have got a rate of attrition as everybody does, um, they do really, really well. Um, and they challenge us as much as we hope we challenge them. And that's why I really like working with serving officers because they've got all that knowledge of the stuff we're talking to them about in a practical sense. So they know, you know, they can relate to a theory and how it might work in practice and challenge it. And that to me is more important than looking at whether or not someone's got an English GCSE. But that is, you know, that's the in-service programme. And um, I know, again, there's lots of differences across the country around the RPEL processes and what people look for. And, you know, it isn't a consistent process. And that was one of the things the college was trying to do with the PQF was to make that process far more consistent. Um, but I think when you're looking at in-service officers, it's got to be a slightly different process. I don't know what you think, Richard, because you did the programme. In fact, I was... Uh... The, the individual that you're talking about was uh, also in my year. Yeah. He won best student. I got the best dissertation, but uh, that's a, another issue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, totally agree with that. And I just wanted to come in for a second because one of the questions on the chat um, has just sort of um, brought to, to my attention the fact that there's still a lot of confusion about some of these things that we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So Sean has said, why do you need maths and English tests at the assessment centre when you have a degree? If you have a degree, you should be going on to the degree holder programme. The degree holder programme, you don't require the English and maths GCSE because it's not an apprenticeship. Rich, it's I think they mean at, at the search assessment centre that they, you still have to do the, the written English and maths test as part of search, I think is what they're saying. Oh, right, and which, which is answered by Martin saying that the assessment centre is a generic test. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. My apologies for getting that confused. Well, I'm going to throw some more confusion in if I can, because some forces like West Yorkshire Police have taken out the written part of the assessment centre because they've looked at the search assessment centre and thought, well, if they've got a level two qualification in English, why are we testing that again? And actually, why are we testing them on maths if they've got to have a level two qualification in maths? So... And actually, the new day one doesn't have a maths test in it. And I've got to say, the hardest math I ever have had to do was, uh, as an inspector, I had to add up money and take money off in terms of my budget. That was it. That was the hardest math I had to do. So all this percentages malarkey that's in the search assessment centre, not sure why it's there. But forces have already started cherry picking bits out. So like I said, West Yorkshire Police, North Yorkshire Police, there's no written assessment. And who knows what's going to come out of the assessment centre anyway, because the College of Policing are designing a new online version. But, you know, what will that look and feel like? I don't know. But then there is this confusion of if I have a degree, I think it's because you can have a degree, but you may not have actually ever studied up to a level two GCSE in English and maths. Am I correct that you could actually complete a degree? without a level two GCSE in English. Yeah, I, th I think there's an, another dimension as well, Brendan, that you, you don't have to have achieved your degree in, you know, the, the two years prior to applying for the degree holder entry route. You could have done your degree 15 years ago and, and apply and be eligible for the degree holder entry route. Um, now, I know if I don't do some writing for six months or a year, I, I, I go to try and write a book chapter or a paper and I 
can barely string a sentence together. So, you know, when, when you get out of practice, it, that can happen. And I think, you know, as we've said, let's not go down the rabbit hole of the assessment center and the merits and pitfalls of search and all this kind of stuff. But I think in, you know, in, in fairness to everyone and to try and keep some consistency um, and just check that that standard is kind of still there. Um, you know, I, I get why it's there, but yeah, it's just worth remembering that not everyone going through the DHEP route will have got their degree very, very recently. Um, so I just might, might explain that in some degree as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that there's a, and I kind of knew this already because, um, you know, the, the, the landscape seems quite confusing to me. And like I said, I, I spend hours looking at this every day. So how's all of this being pulled together nationally? Because I would have thought there'd be some overarching sort of no, this is the way it needs to be. Or, or can, can we even attempt to do that with the universities? Because remember, um, ACC Angela Williams from West Yorkshire Police, uh, just before Christmas at a Skills for Justice event, said you know it's interesting now because we've now got universities deciding on whether we recruit because they've got to write a, a thousand a thousand word essay um, i'm not quite sure what the title of the essay is but that's part of the recruitment process derbyshire police have something similar i think so is that is there something pulling all together from a from an academic university perspective or or i don't know you know what again one of one of the one of the issues that's come out of this is Yes, there is a national curriculum, but the specific and there's the rule, the ESFA rules about how uh, a degree apprenticeship works. But again, it seems to be left to the individual forces and universities how they actually implement um, those things. So, for example, um, you know, with the forces that Claudia and I are working with through the consortium. Um, we sat down with the forces and we said, well, this is what we would like, but it is at the end of the day, the responsibility to the forces to do the recruitment. Um, and while we've had an input on that, we've said what we would like. And um, fortunately the forces listened to us. And so their entry criteria, um, they followed our guidance, but they don't have to, they don't have to do that either. Um, so there's, I think there's been a very uneven um, application um, of some of these standards across the 43 forces. Um, Claudia, I don't know if you want to come in on that as well. Yeah, I just, I, I think it's reminded me again of something else that frustrates me slightly is people saying, you know, what, why are academics deciding what police officers need to know? Um, just want to really try and debunk that that is not the case. So in terms of, you know, there are lots of differences and, you know, we've spoken about that, but there are consistencies. So, for example, what students learn is dictated by the College of Policing's curriculum. doesn't matter which entry route you come on, the College of Policing have set that curriculum um, and we must teach that curriculum. So it doesn't matter which force, which university you go to, you should learn the same things. Might be in different ways, but you will, you will have the same knowledge at the end of it. Um, the College of Policing also has to come in and, you know, we say this is how we plan to, to deliver this course um, and they have to assess that. And we have to have independent academics and people from the college come and assess that our plans are adhering to the College of Policing and, and what they want it to look like. And of course, they then have oversight of all of those courses. So again, while there will be differences, you have the college kind of sat at the middle, making sure that we are all um, hitting what needs to be hit. Um, in terms of recruitment, you know, that that is one of those things that I think will remain controversial. I see the argument for having UCAS points because it's about, well, you're coming to study at level four and we need to make sure that you you you're going to be successful you're going to be able to cope with this there's the other argument of um actually and i kind of subscribe to this thing higher education should be as accessible as possible and degree apprenticeship route in particular for widening participation should be as accessible as possible um you know so i think there's always going to be arguments for and against differentiation but just really want to reiterate that at the heart of this there are consistencies in terms of ensuring that police officers have the same knowledge, skills and behaviours that, that they need to be fully operationally competent at the end of the two or the three years. Yeah, and I can imagine that there'd be an uproar if the College of Policing said, no, university, you have, and police force, you have to deliver this particular lesson, if we can call it that, in mm -hmm. this way. Uh, I remember yeah. the College of Policing did that back in the 90s. They, they, they gave an edict that 
you know, these are the lesson plans, you must deliver them like that. Um, and we had training development officers who were the sort of assessors of trainers saying, look, if any of my student officers put this in front of me, I'd fail them. Mm. Um, but it was a sort of big stick approach and it wasn't popular at all and it lasted a couple of years and went, went out, out the window. So it, it does, it, it, it's no different than any form of education, is it? You know, no, just, and we want you to get an A-level. It's up to you how you deliver the learning for the students so they can pass that A-level. Yeah, and if you go for that very prescriptive approach, you're, you're overlooking local issues. So different police forces have different policing priorities, but even just down logistically, like police estate um, and how big the rooms are and how big the cohorts are. And then the Boris 20,000 uplift came. And of course that span everything on its head all over again. Um, you know, so, so there are so many local differences that have to be taken into consideration here. Um, so, so absolutely, there's, there's got to be some flexibility and I know that causes frustration and sometimes it maybe goes a bit too far but yeah just just recognizing there is some logic behind it. So I think the message there is but I suppose if anyone's a bit confused and I'm looking at some people in the chat room and talking about all, all their different backgrounds and it is that diversity that makes the police service so wonderful anyway you know the fact that police officers have one thing in common they've all got a warrant card in their pocket but the thing they have not in common is they're from all sorts of different backgrounds and I'm quite sure the police service wants to encourage that but I suppose what I'd, I'd say, and I don't know if you want to tag on the message to this, is if you've got something that's slightly not the thing that they're looking for, get in touch with the, the, the force and make it really clear that this is my background, these are my qualifications, is this okay? And get it in writing as well, get it in writing, because I've seen so many people get all the way to the end of the process and the force will check on their medical, their vetting, educational qualifications. And like I said in the case before, which... I thought it was a bit tragic, really. I expected a bit more flexibility from the service with someone. And I suppose there's all that there's, you know, from her as well, she's quite happy as a PCSO. There's almost a, because she succeeded, there's almost an element of age discrimination there because she wasn't given the opportunity to do A-levels. Back in the 70s and 80s, if you went to, if you went to do A-levels, it's because you were going to go to university pretty much. So um, I don't know what advice you'd give there from a university perspective in terms of individuals who want a career in the police but are not quite sure if, they've got what it's going to take. Bethany? I think the first thing to say is that we're all learning as we go along um, and that's the forces and all universities that are part of this process in terms of um, how we can support students in gaining a place on either the DHEP uh, the PCDA or the, the, even the pre-joined degree um, and what entry requirements they need and how we can support them in, in getting them. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, I think we, we've all been in, in, a, in a position where we have had to let that student down at the final hurdle, which is a shame. Um, it is such a shame. Uh, it's a shame no, no matter what sort of whereabouts they are in the recruitment process. If you're telling them at the beginning that then they're just not eligible, um, then unfortunately, um, you know, that, that's just something that they are going to have to um, accept. But it's key to mention that we do provide the support in helping them to obtain the correct qualifications in order to get there um, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be two years worth of uh, qualification um, time or, or whatever. Um, I also, also um, think it, it's important to say that as we are learning, as we are going along, we are coming across more instances of people that have got significant life experience. Um, it may be um, skills that they've, they've had as a previous career in um, military for example, that they could really closely align to becoming a police officer, um, but unfortunately they don't have level two and all level three. Um, and at, um, at the moment, obviously, our entry requirements are our entry requirements and we have to be very, very strict in, in, in what we're asking for students to, to sort of to have in order to, to gain a place. Um, Recognise prior learning is massively important and we do need to look at it in a bit more detail. Um, at Staffordshire University are looking at that at the moment and um, seeing how um, we can fairly judge exactly what recognised prior learning means um, and how we can apply that to certain individuals who have come from certain backgrounds and careers, as, as you point out. Um, so that's something that it, um, I think is, is important to say. Um, and, and obviously, quite a lot of students um, do have that experience. Um, quite a lot of students are PCSOs or special constables and still don't have those um, those qualifications. So it's about how we how we can uh, re recognize recognize that really and support them. Um, but obviously it is something that is a, a work in progress and it does need to be looked at properly, fairly and concisely um, in order to make it fair ultimately um, to, to work in the future. Um, it, I will say though that um, I think 
as I've said before, we are all learning as we go along. Our recruitment process now is fail safe. We've learned hard lessons along the way um, and all qualifications are looked at right at the application stage. So as soon as um, um, a student applies, and the forces then ask for their certificates. Um, if they can um, assess or grade them, then they will. If they can't, because it's 15 years old or it just it isn't available on the UCAS calculator, then that's where um, our recruitment um, university recruitment comes into the situation and we will then assess and, ass assess and assist. Um, they will not go through vetting or even search assessment if we're not 100% certain that they meet the entry criteria. Fair. Go on. Uh, and I think that's what people look, you use that word quite a few times, fair. Um, and I think most people would accept that this is work in progress, that you've got to start somewhere. Um, and we started a couple of years ago with this and there will always be teething problems. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'll come to you in a moment about what, what the benefits for the community is. But Claudia, I know you want to come in with yeah. some... Just a, really, just a really quick one to add to what Bethany said there about people who have maybe been PCSO, specials or military. There are a number of, certainly one if not a number of forces who will say either one A-level equivalent or military experience with an exemplary reference or if you have passed your probationary period in a, um, in like as a special or any other police staff role. Um, so again, if there are people out there going, well, I, you know, I've been a special for five years, I've gained a dependent status, but I never went to college. Again, there are forces who will have those conversations and who may well accept that in place of a level three. So again, it just comes back to this, um, making sure you look at your forces specific requirements, you get in touch with them uh, and that, because you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, is this going to exclude ex-military? Um, you know, if they have you know, left school and gone straight into the military, is this going to exclude them from joining the police because they won't have the qualifications? And the answer is no, not always, because there are some forces that, that will recognise that. So again, if there's anyone watching this who's, who's thinking they might fall into that category, um, please don't rule yourself out because you haven't got an A-level or a B-tech or, or anything like that. And the other thing to add to that is, you know, if you don't have the pre prerequisite qualifications or experience that's needed, I suppose it might sound harsh, but the police don't owe you a living. You know, they don't owe you a living. So um, there's something about professional development here and just thinking if, if this is a job I really want, if this is a career of choosing that I really, really want, and really, really desire and I'm absolutely wedded to, I will go back to night school and I'll get that qualification or I will do something online or I will do something to get myself to that point. But I, I do hear some people belly aching sometimes and I'm going to say belly aching because it's a... <laughs> It's the inspector in me saying, you know, stop bellyaching. They're bellyaching and it sounds like the police, they think the police owes them a career. And it doesn't, you know, it's, a, it's the most honourable honorable career I can, I can see that exists, but then again, I'm biased. Um, and if we let you in, you know, if we let you in, you could do untold damage in communities if you're not the right sort of person. But then again, if you're the right sort of person, you can, you can do incredible things. Um, and support people in incredible ways and, and leave, re resign or retire with honour. Um, but there's got to be some sifting process. And I suppose whilst we have 43 different versions of the sifting process, we're going to get 43 different versions of the sifting process. And we've just got to work around that um, and see what we can do to make it as uh, open as possible. And I think that gets back to what a few people have mentioned there. Check the websites and if in doubt, get in touch. Um, okay, I'm going to move things on a little bit and I'm just going to look in, I'm just going to try and wrap up some of the questions that people have asked in the chat if I can, because uh, I, I think we're, we're talking a lot about the sort of entry conditions and such like. I, I'm just, um, you know, we're, we're over an hour now and I just want to sort of wrap up with a few questions if I can. Um, the, for those who uh, join your university and embark on this uh, route as a, a student officer, um, what's the, the one thing they're most surprised about as a student at your university? So one thing that they are most surprised about that you go, no, no, that's, that's what we planned. Um, Rich, yourself. I think one of the things that um, students that I've been uh, teaching with have been so surprised about is how much that the academic staff and the police training staff are operating almost as a seamless single entity. Um, you know, we've designed the program so that it's not, this is, this is the academic side and this is the police training side that we've actually merged them in a way that the two 
inform each other and the fact that you know we could go into a lecture and if it wasn't for the fact that the police trainers were in uniform they probably wouldn't have been able to tell which of us were lecturers and which of us were um uh, police training staff to be honest because we're we we've wanted to make sure that this was delivered as a single team and that's definitely the um the feeling that i get and i think that's one of the things that the students have been very surprised about that there hasn't been this demarcation between what is academic and what is professional um mm. that they 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 merge there and they're informing the same the, the same things love it it sounds almost like a, i know some people don't like this word but the pracademic mm. Yeah, the, pra the practical academic. Uh, Lauren, one thing that students are surprised at when they go to uh, the courses at Stafford University. Um, so I think this is probably different for pre-join versus um, the apprenticeship. Uh, with the apprenticeship, I think uh, some of the feedback that we've got, they've talked around um, how they are a bit surprised that a lot of the teaching stuff on the the university side are, have operational backgrounds and they actually really enjoy that um, that learning in terms of contextualizing the learning from their own experience um, and they also like like the amount of reflection I think they, they weren't quite um, expecting the amount of reflection that they have to do and how this actually makes up some of the assessments throughout the modules um, and a lot of them do maybe struggle with that at the start but have that have the academic support time to to get on board with that. In terms of the pre-join, um, I think the one thing that they're a bit shocked with is the, the amount of content because it is a quite a heavy degree. Um, but they they really enjoy the group work, working together, um, and getting them skills of teamwork in that obviously will then help them out when they eventually join the police. Lovely, thanks Lauren. And uh, Martin, uh, here in York, or actually it won't be here in York, it'll be here in Humberside, won't it? So, oh, don't, don't refer to it that. We're in the East Riding of Yorkshire. <laughs> 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 Sounds so much nicer, because everybody says Humberside, well that's Hull, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, there's, there's a couple of ways I think that's really, really important, and, uh, and you know, and we, we've talked about some of these before, is that uh, the degrees that we're doing now, and, and Claudia certainly mentioned it, the degrees we're doing now, whilst, yeah, the content is very large on some of the modules, it's the way we're assessing them and the way we're teaching them. So, as you say, it's more about how you would look at a police officer role, look at that role, people work in teams, they're leaders, you know, they make decisions, they problem solve. So a lot more of the sort of teaching is around that and certainly the assessments. I know we, we did an event, uh, myself and a colleague, Mark Welton, who's uh, ex-Met uh, Richard. Uh, he um, he uh, came along with me to uh, Hull, Humberside Police Headquarters, uh, and we, we were chatting to potential recruits there and they were worried about the, you know, assessment methods. And we say, well, when you look at assessments, it's the same for the pre-join. What we do is we look at the role of a police officer and say, right, what sort of things can we assess that relate to the role of a police officer? So in some case, it might be developing a problem solving plan, which is just something they do as police officers. So what we always aim to do, and the, the, for our, certainly for our pre-join, and obviously we're still developing the others, there is very little essay writing. It is doing things, methods of assessment that they will use in real life policing scenarios and assessing them against that. And I think once they've started to see that, um, I think that that's really a positive thing. I think the uh, agreeing with Lauren, um, one of the things that they're absolutely worried about is the amount of law, you know, because, you know, these a lot of the pre-joined students, obviously the sort of 18, 19 year olds, they come in and they just don't realize that you, have to learn the law and i think that's something we've learned from this first year of running the pre-join is that we need to reflect on that and really sort of push that idea a bit more with them do all the other academic material but really get them to study and understand that law yeah lovely thanks martin uh okay. Claudia. Yeah, I think I'm probably going to, I tried to think of something original, but I think I'm probably going to echo a couple of points that have been made. Um, obviously, I'm speaking from the degree apprenticeship um, perspective with this. 
but I think it's um, been kind of overcoming that mindset that you're learning to be a police officer and you're studying a degree and that these two are somehow mutually exclusive. And, uh, you know, I know that, you know, you, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, well, if I fail the degree, can I still be a cop? It's, but then they are not mutually exclusive. They are absolutely linked. Um, you, you get the degree for demonstrating that you have the knowledge required of a police officer. You are signed off as being fully operationally competent because you have demonstrated that you, you have the behaviors and you have the practical skills. The two are completely linked. If you fail to demonstrate that you have the knowledge required of a police officer, that is a fundamental problem. And, and no, you won't be confirmed in post because you have demonstrated a gap in your knowledge needed as a cop. And um, so trying to, I think people have been really surprised when they've come in. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't do three weeks of learning to be a cop. And then I just pop over to university for a day, write some essays, submit it, and then just park that idea. Um, it's the fact that it all joins together. Um, and it was quite difficult at the beginning sometimes to maybe try and convey that and it was a real learning point for us that we we need to make that a lot clearer um because i think when you get so engrossed in it and writing it and designing and preparing it you you kind of take it for granted so you know i, I really wouldn't want anyone to be applying for the degree apprenticeship thinking that it's kind of you need to be doing two full-time jobs at the same time um, because it's not about that it is going to be challenging and it is going to be time consuming in many ways but anything that is academic whether it's an assessment or a lecture or a seminar or a workshop or whatever is all is all about giving you the skills you need to do your job um, and to apply those skills in the workplace and I, I think that's such an important message that's maybe been lost in the degree apprenticeship route a little bit um, and something that students are surprised by. Yeah no I kind of like the idea of that because um, you know part of me uh, call me controversial but I kind of expect police officers to have a qualification because I did it for 28 years and I've got no qualifications in policing whatsoever. Um, and I kind of like the idea of putting my operational police officer's head on as well, thinking that actually I do want my police officers to know their powers inside and out so they can apply them correctly. But I also want them to think about the impact of applying those powers in certain ways and the legitimacy and how they link in with partner agencies and that complex problem solving and looking for the causes of the causes. And, and, and looking further upstream to see why people fall in the river. Actually, let's go beyond that point and, and, and look at how we enable and support communities to be the best versions of themselves they can be. Oh my goodness, you can, the one thing I realised after three decades in policing was how little I knew. How little Brendan, I knew. Brendan, sorry, can I just come no. in there quickly? Yeah, sorry, uh, it's just to say that from a different perspective in terms of teaching serving officers, I think the most rewarding thing for us as a team as a whole team is when they come in and say that through their career no matter how long they've been in the career they've always been told what they've got to do it's about what to do but they've never really been given any information about why they're doing that or where that information has come from mm -hmm. so i have to say that the extended learning that goes beyond the classroom which is really important not just for the officer who's doing the course and bearing in mind that our students all pay for the course themselves this is a you know a decision they do make the, on their own but they also take that learning back to their teams they extend that learning that they've got from the classroom put it into practice so thinking about that theory within a practical environment and then they'll talk to their teams about it and I have to say, one of the most rewarding days I ever had was a sergeant in the Met, who's now at Kent Police, very active on Twitter. I won't tell you who it is. But she came into the classroom one day at the end of the lecture. She said, I don't believe this. Don't bloody believe it. I've just talked to my, my team about bloody procedural justice and legitimacy. What is that about? You know, <laughs> she'd taken all that learning back to her team who were involved at the time in stop, stop and searches and said to them, this is why you've got to do it like this. This is the theory behind it. This is the outcome if you do it right. And she was almost kind of feeling a bit like, what have I done? You know, what have I done? What's <laughs> happened to me? But it was amazing, you know, and that was a real aha moment for her because in her career, which was quite a long career actually, she had never been told why she was doing what she was doing. It was always what you've got to do. And that to me is what we're all about. That's what it's about to me. Um, and that's, you know, that is an eye opener for them, for, for sure. I can, I can, but there's, there's something about how you couch it. You've just, 
reminded me of a moment with one of my sergeants, actually two of my sergeants, one of them was good enough to just shut up and not say anything. Um, but it's, uh, I was trying to apply some of the learning around what I'd done in my master's for education. So I went to Bachelor University and did a master's in education, um, of all things. Um, and I was applying the sort of uh, qualitative uh, fourth, eva uh, fourth generation evaluation, Goober and Lincoln's work, uh, to looking at how we do stakeholder involvement in a community. And um, I, I used the phrase hermeneutic dialectic. And <laughs> <laughs> you can just imagine what happened next, can't you? Um, <laughs> Good old Roger turned around and said, boss, if, if you don't mind, um, if you effing say anything like that again, I'm going to ask you to leave the police station, you know, with respect, but you're talking like an absolute knob. And I just thought, you, you know, you're so right. I've got to couch this in a way that makes sense. But it was that, it was that that enabled me quite proudly to go on to do some amazing things with communities and, and do some work eventually with the European Union around community engagement and problem solving. And if it wasn't for that insight into what people would say is an academic world that would have never happened so um you know i'm all for this i suppose i'm biased a little bit because i've seen how it works but that's one thing that surprised me was how you can get an insight into um a, a world that you didn't even know existed that has so many lessons in policing um and you know why reinvent everything all over again when you can extract the learning from the sector or from other sectors and i've I'm still doing that now, you know, um, 20 years on. Anyway, Bethany, we didn't ask you what surprises, you know, in, in terms of your students, what are they most surprised by um, at to your university? I think that um, from a recruitment perspective, they are extremely um, surprised at the recruitment process. I don't think anyone is prepared, um, in no matter how well you prepare them for the recruitment process. Um, obviously, the one that we, um, the recruitment process that we work with um, across all forces is quite generic. So I think that um, I am therefore um, entitled to say that I imagine quite a lot of the forces use the kind of the same kind of recruitment process. Um, I don't think anyone's prepared for how uh, difficult and time consuming that that process actually is. Um, so um, it, it, that again reinforces the point that you said earlier. Um, I really liked when you when you sort of said that, um, you know, it, it, the, the force don't owe you anything. Um, if you are committed to be wanting to become a police officer, then you may have to go through this process more than just once. Um, I had a friend who I think must have attended search assessment centre maybe eight times before he finally got through. Um, but he was so committed to becoming a police officer that he was prepared to go through that recruitment process over and over again. Um, quite a lot of, um, I had this conversation earlier actually, when we go out and deliver um, recruitment talks at recruitment events, there are quite, you know, the, um, the, the market, if you will, is saturated with um, young people that have such a passion to become a police officer. But actually, when they come to going through that recruitment process, I don't think they are at all um, ready for what's, go what's going to come. Um, so although we're kind of um, preparing them in our recruitment events and, you know, we're encouraging people to come to these kind of sessions and attend as many recruitment events as you can so you can understand the process. Um, they probably don't realise that they may have to go through it quite a few times before they actually do finally get there in the end. And that's like I said earlier, regardless of the qualifications that they have actually obtained. Um, a good um, a good thing, um, a thing that um, our students like, um, and this is on the delivery side, um, and Claudia has mentioned it quite quite a lot, um, is the delivery side um, of the uh, the PCDA and the DHEP. Um, I can't really talk about the pre-join, that's more Lauren's area than mine, um, but it's it's so diverse, every day is different. Um, one of the uh, things that we have in our PCDA um, and DHEP is um, a student has to um, get their independent patrol within the first year. Um, so the only way to do that is to go out and do it. Um, you have a, um, a mentor with you at all times, then they may change. Um, you may be doing response one day, investigation the next, um, as well as chucking in some online learning. And um, it's really, really diverse. And the case studies that we've gathered um, and the students that we speak to love the diversity of the programme and how exciting it is because of how varied and different it is. Um, and how, how rewarded they feel um, because they are doing the academic bit alongside the um, operational bit and as Claudia has said before they are totally intertwined um, and that's that's a good thing because um, 
uh, part of the assessment method is that they have to complete a reflective diary. So they're putting what they've learned in the classroom into practice on operationally and vice versa. Um, and it's, it's really, really exciting for them to be able to document something that they've been a part of and they've actually seen on the ground in the field. Um, so um, it, it's a huge positive and we absolutely love hearing from students um, that are part of the programme. Um, it ma makes me smile because I, um, it, it's really, it, it's good to see how excited and passionate they are when they're actually out um, sort of in the field as police officers. So um, the, there's a negative and a, and a positive sort of right there from a recruitment and a, a delivery perspective. That's so interesting that because what I see among candidates who want to join the police is this amazing positivity, this this enthusiasm which just has no bounds. But one of the things that you, you touched on there is that um, you know, I, I think sometimes they might read the College of Policing blurb that says you don't really need to prepare for the assessment process, just be yourself and act naturally. And I just think, do you know that is possibly the worst advice ever? Because if I was going for my dream job, my dream career. I'd be practicing every day, yeah. I'd be preparing, yeah. I'd be doing something, I'd be expanding my knowledge base, I'd be practicing interview questions, I'd be, I'd be doing it every day and yeah. reflecting on that, reflecting on my experience and thinking, what can I do to improve it next time? You know, yeah. On a daily basis. Uh, and, and so that you're not having to go through it two or three, eight times to get through, that you just get through first time every time. But you know, navigating yourself, your, your way through that process and through uh, the demands of the universities as well, I think is, I don't think it's ever not going to be confusing. If you've got 43 forces, we're always going to have that. You yeah, know, I think that Staffordshire University, um, especially our recruitment development team, have put so much effort into working in partnership with the forces that we work with to get a real sense of exactly what is required when it comes to their recruitment process. I mean, we know ours inside out. We know the compliance. We know the eligibility. Um, we know the entry criteria. Um, what we didn't know in the beginning, perhaps, um, is exactly how fundamental their recruitment process is. Um, so the effort that we've recently put in is attending their search assessments, watching exactly what happens, exactly what's expected of students and um, providing support and um, so now when we go out and deliver recruitment talks and events we pay specific attention to the actual recruitment process we tell students to get in touch with us and um, if they're invited to a search assessment center we provide the support before and afterwards throughout the whole process and um, we would like to think that we are intertwined throughout our own processes and the forces and um, because we've tried to align them as closely as possible so students do feel comfortable to contact us and say, um, you know, I've been invited to an interview, I've, I've been invited to a search assessment, what help can you offer? Um, just to try and get them through that process as much as we can because we do know how uh, hard and difficult it can be. Yeah, challenging and interesting. You sound almost like competition for me, but hey-ho. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of Italian restaurants, you know, Italian restaurant, oh no, there's five in the city already, well there's room for six. Um, no, <laughs> You know, one of the things I love to do is, you know, help support people in, in any way possible. It's, you know, it's one of it's the reason I get out of bed. I make a living out at the same time, but ultimately, you know, I get to support people. I see the smiles on their faces. I see the photographs of their attestation parades with their children and their family looking at them all proud. You know, you can't beat that, can you? You can't beat that moment. Well, listen, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, there's so many more questions I could have asked about, uh, you know, the, that we didn't actually talk about the three different ways in. Um, we didn't talk about um, uh, the fast track that Knox Police and Derby University have got, you know, two years and you can do your pre-joined degree. Um, we didn't talk about uh, how the operation officers find time for the degree, what support they're given. Um, we didn't look at, we, we, looked, we touched on assessment, um, we touched on, actually we touched on a lot of those questions, but I, I'm just wondering. So let's see what the feedback is uh, from everyone who watches this, because it's going to get uh, broadcast to thousands, thousands. <laughs> Honestly, thousands will watch this in, in a week's time. This will go on YouTube today. In a week's time, uh, my guess is it will have had in excess of 10,000 views. 10,000 views. That's the sort of reach it's going to get. So I'm quite sure. Uh, I'm going to invite everyone actually who's watching this still, because if you're still watching this after an hour and a half, it means that you are absolutely dedicated to getting into the police service and you should be exactly the person who should be sending me a message to say, I've got a question for you. I'm not sure about. Uh, so I'll just do a sort of um, nods from the room if it'd be okay for me to 
forward any of those questions to you. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of nods, fantastic. Um, about any element of the, um, the policing qualification route. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, based on that, let's see what the feedback is. Uh, wondering whether I could invite you back at some point in the future for another session where we can talk all things uh, policing educational qualifications framework. It's not everyone's cup of tea on a, on a, what day are we now? Thursday afternoon? Is it Thursday? No. Wednesday? Thursday. Thursday. No, Thursday. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Every day just blends into another, doesn't it? So, um, you know, there's probably room for another conversation and maybe even bringing in someone who's sort of anti-degree anti for whatever reason. That might make it more interesting, eh? So someone maybe from Bill Skelly's um, crew in uh, Lincolnshire. Is it Lincolnshire? Yeah. Uh, am I right? Yeah. yeah. So that might make it a more interesting conversation because I'm acutely aware that we're all kind of for qualifications. Um, so I wonder if that might make it a more interesting conversation in the future. But listen, um, all I can say to all of you fabulous panellists, uh, for those of you I've met before, it's great to see you again. And for those of you I'm meeting in the, for the first time, although um, online, but you know, better than just over Twitter, uh, fabulous meeting you. And thank you very much for your contribution. It's just been amazing, you know. And what I've liked is, and I'm sure everyone else will thank me on, on, uh, thank them on uh, your, their behalf, is that sort of, it may be controversial, or actually I'm just gonna say this, that sort of uh, honesty from you all, can I, thank you for that, because I'm quite sure that'll be absolutely appreciated by everyone who's watched this. So what I'm gonna do now is just ask you all for a big wave, uh, embarrassingly, you know, big shout out, um, and I shall see you soon. <laughs> and the recording will be live. Bye. 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 Thanks, Brendan. Thank you for having us. Thank Bye. you. Bye.